Uh, kia ora, nā mihi nui ke koutou katoa. Greetings everybody, welcome to our Friday's media conference. I'll now hand directly over to the Director of Public Health, Dr McElnay, to update us on the latest case numbers and then I'll make a few brief remarks before taking your questions. Dr McElnay. Thank you Deputy Prime Minister and kia ora koutou katoa. There are nine new community cases to report today, all in the Auckland region. That takes our total numbers associated with this outbreak to 1,131. Of those, 902 cases have now recovered. Additionally, there is one new case in a recent returnee in our managed isolation facility. Of today's nine new community cases, all are linked. Three are household contacts and six are contacts of known cases. For yesterday's 15 cases, only one remains unlinked and investigations into the case are underway to determine if there are any connections. There are 13 people in hospital with three of those in ICU. Testing numbers in Auckland dropped a little yesterday, but 6,928 swabs were still taken across Auckland with 14,855 swabs processed across the country. At our new suburb of interest, Mount Wellington, there were 297 swabs taken yesterday. That's a great effort, so thanks to everyone who came forward to be tested. In Clover Park, which has been a suburb of interest um, this week, 1,725 swabs have been taken since Tuesday. Since the 1st of September, 20.8% of that suburb's population have been tested, which is a great effort, but we still want people to come forward for testing in that suburb. Public health officials in Auckland continue to carry out surveillance testing at larger essential workplaces, and their focus next week will turn to construction and retail sectors. As Dr. Bloomfield mentioned yesterday, there is a new testing requirement for people who need to travel across the alert level boundary for personal reasons. That requirement is for most people permitted to travel for personal reasons from the alert level three boundary into an alert level two area. For example, traveling from Auckland to Hamilton. These people now need to carry evidence of a negative test result taken 72 hours prior to their travel or proof a test was taken within seven days prior to their travel. There are two exceptions to this testing requirement. No test is required for the following. For one-way travel, for people traveling from an alert level two into alert level three and then remaining there. And for people attending a healthcare appointment, including vaccinations, who are traveling from their residence in alert level two into alert level three and then back into alert level two. They do need to have evidence of their appointment and, and be able to show that if requested. Details of the testing requirements can be found on the Unite Against COVID, COVID website. Just a reminder, it can take 24 to 48 hours to get a uh, results of your test, sometimes long, longer depending on the demand for testing. So please plan ahead and factor that into the time uh, for your travel. A reminder that people who cannot provide the required evidence will be turned around at the boundary by police at checkpoints and aviation security staff at Auckland Airport. Please note that the testing requirements for permitted workers crossing the alert level boundary are unchanged. That is proof of a test taken seven days prior to their travel. But Minister Robinson will talk further about the requirements for those travelling for business. Just some um, comments on the upper hierarchy outbreak. All tests in upper hierarchy have now come back negative, with the exception of members of the Whakatiwai household, which were, have already been announced. I can also report there's been a good uptake of vaccinations in the hierarchy plains, with 60.1% of residents there now having had their first dose and 23.9% their second. And just turning to our vaccine rollout, there have been more than 4.91 million doses given. Of those, more than 3.19 million were first doses, 
covering 76% of the eligible population and more than 1.72 million or 41% of the eligible population. That's the population aged over 12, 12 and over. Yesterday, more than 49,115 doses were administered. That's broken down into 20,983 first doses and 28,132 second doses. So those second dose numbers are coming up. In Auckland yesterday, there were 16,258 vaccines given. Overall in Auckland, more than 1.7 million doses have been administered. Of those, 1.16 million were first doses, covering 81% of the Auckland population, and 626,103 second doses, covering 44% of the population. The Ministry of Health is also updating its advice about having routine vaccinations at the same time as the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. Our initial guidance was that there should be a gap of between two to four weeks. We've um, received further advice from our technical advisory group and we now advise that the majority of routine vac vaccinations can be either given before, after or at the same time as the COVID-19 vaccine. There is an exception to that, and that is the Zostavax vaccine or the shingles vaccine, uh, where there do does still need to be a gap between receiving it and receiving the Pfizer vaccine. We will be updating the information to health, uh, health professionals about that today and on our website. What that means is that uh, it, can, it will help ensure that our routine immunisation programmes such as MMR and HPV can continue without disruption whilst we're rolling out the COVID-19 vaccine. And just finally today, I'd like to acknowledge pharmacists across the Motu as it's World Pharmacists Day tomorrow, Saturday. Pharmacists have delivered 14% of all vaccines last week from around 250 pharmacies around the country. Um, they have really stepped up and helped us in our vaccination um, rollout for this outbreak. They've used their very strong community link, links and relationships with people to make sure that people can continue to get vaccinated. So I'd like to thank them very much for their hard work. Back to you, Deputy Prime Minister. And I'm here, Dr McElnay. Just a few brief comments from me before we take questions. Firstly, ministers have today agreed that the Upper Hauraki will move down to alert level two at 11.59 p.m. on Saturday. As uh, Dr McElnay has indicated, we've had an incredible response from the Upper Hauraki community with people getting tested following the health advice and sticking to the alert level requirements. More than 1,000 tests have been under undertaken in the immediate area since Monday with the only positive results, as you've heard, being from the original household. All the close contacts from the Mangatangi school exposure event, including staff and students, have been tested with all tests returning negative. Widespread wastewater testing in Maramarua, Merimeri, Natia, Paeroa and Waitakaruru this week has produced no unexpected detections. The public health assessment is that it is now safe for Upper Hauraki to move to Alert Level 2 along with the rest of New Zealand, except for Auckland of course, which remains at Alert Level 3. Secondly, today's case numbers are encouraging and they indicate that the hard work of Aucklanders in particular is paying off. But as you have heard us say before, the job is not yet done. As we head into this weekend, I once again ask for people in Auckland to remember that it is still alert level three. We need you to stick to your bubble and to stick to the rules. Second, uh, thirdly, we continue to make good progress on vaccination. As the, as the Director of Public Health has just told us, 76% of the eligible population now have a first dose. Today, I want to particularly mihi to our Māori health providers for coming up with innovative ways to bring whānau forward to get vaccinated so that they are protected against the virus. For example, this Saturday in the Waikato Rohi, there is a mass vax event from 10am to 3pm to deliver vaccinations. And can I encourage whānau across the Waikato to go to the Hopu Hopu Sports Ground in Naro Wahia to get vaccinated? I do hear that there are prizes on offer, including a trip to Rarotonga. You just need to show up, no booking is necessary. The government continues to provide significant support to workers and businesses as we contain the current Delta outbreak. 
As of this morning, 593,262 applications for the wage subsidy have been approved, totalling more than $2.5 billion in payments. The second round of the resurgent support payment has now been open for a week and has paid out $256.8 million to 87,647 applicants. We're working closely with the Ministry of Social Development and Inland Revenue to clear any backlogs in processing. This includes outbound calling to those whose applications are still pending. As I've said a couple of times, one of the issues is different details being held by Inland Revenue than what is on the application for the wage subsidy. We do ask people to look carefully at this as they make their applications. With the move of Auckland into Alert Level 3 this week, we estimate about 280,000 more people will have been able to go back to work. And I'd just like to remind everyone of the rules for businesses at Alert Level 3. Firstly, staff should continue to work from home if they can. If your business requires close physical contact, it cannot operate under Alert Level 3. Your business must be contactless with the public. Your customers can pay online, over the phone, or in a contactless way. Delivery or pickup must also be contactless. Staff should remain at least a metre apart and two metres away from any other person. In terms of travel, as the Prime Minister indicated on Monday, permitted movement across the Alert Level 3 and 2 boundary is essentially the same as it was when Auckland was at Alert Level 4. This is because we are dealing with the Delta variant, which as we know is far more transmissible. The strong advice from our public health officials is that we do need to continue to take a precautionary approach. In the case of businesses, you need the business travel document and you need to be tested, uh, you need to be part of the testing regime. Key movement like freight and primary industries is allowed to ensure food and other supplies can move. There is an obligation on employers to have systems and processes in place to minimise travel of workers between alert level areas and mitigate the risks of spreading COVID when workers are travelling. If you're not sure of the rules, please do go to the Unite Against COVID-19 website to check them. Having said all of this, we recognise that the longer the restrictions are in place, the more challenging it is for people to meet deadlines, such as the settlement of house sales or starting jobs outside the region. Equally, those who have been in Auckland undertaking carer duties may have completed these, but they are currently unable to leave. There is an exemptions regime for both personal and business travel that is ultimately managed by the Director General of Health. We have agreed that ministers will work with the Ministry of Health to look at the exemptions regime to facilitate some more one-way movement to relocate out of Auckland. We anticipate that this will include testing requirements. Ministers will consider this advice on Monday and we will announce any changes as soon as possible given the pressure that we know some people are under. Just before we go to questions, for those watching at home, this is to let you know that there will be no 1pm media conferences on Saturday or Sunday, just the statement from the Ministry of Health with the latest case numbers. And finally, you will have seen earlier today myself and Minister Andrew Little released the first report of the Implementation Unit, which looked at the 2019 mental health package. Minister Little will be here at about 1.30 and we can take any questions on that matter after we've finished with the COVID-related ones. Mikey. Deputy Prime Minister, you touched on it earlier, but hitting single digits in terms of those case numbers, how much confidence should Kiwis take that we are on top of this latest outbreak? Well, as I think you've heard a number of times from public health officials and also from ministers, we don't believe that there is widespread community transmission in Auckland. It was one of the reasons we felt comfortable to move down to alert level three. What we do know is that there are still isolated cases, but we do feel we are getting on top of this outbreak. And it's the reason why I said we've just got to stick at it. Having come so far here, this is why we need Aucklanders to make sure they stick to the Alert Level 3 rules so that we can get those cases down even further. Does this show that we are on track to elimination to zero cases? Well, that's our goal, and it's always been our goal to get to elimination of cases in this outbreak. 
Um, that's why we have the measures we do at alert level four and alert level three. We may see case numbers pop up a little bit again too, because bear in mind, each time a case is identified, we then move into uh, the contact tracing process, and there are house side contacts um, who may not have known that they uh, had the virus. So it's possible that we will see case numbers still bounce up and down a little bit. But I think what this trend is showing is that the measures we've taken are working, and if people stick to the rules, we'll continue to see the numbers come down. Can you just clarify something you said? Amelia, sorry, and then we'll come to you, Jason. Um, just clarify um, why Mount Wellington is now a suburb of interest? Um, and do, are there cases there, or sort of just go into the detail of why that's now included? Um, that's advice that we've received from Auckland Regional Public Health. So that's based on their analysis of cases and clusters and some of the movements, and they've identified that in addition to the other suburbs that we've announced this week um, as a particular suburb that we would like to really encourage testing. And just to add on to that, particularly for Clover Park, and you heard um, the details about that earlier, and Mount Wellington, we're encouraging everyone in those suburbs to go and get tested, whether you're symptomatic or asymptomatic. This is part of our surveillance testing, just to give us that absolute assurance that there are no cases out there that we don't know about. As Dr McElnay mm -hmm. says, in the case of Mount Wellington, we've got some cases associated with that suburb within our clusters. This is a real opportunity uh, for the people of Mount Wellington to go out and get tested. And and I do just want to thank uh, the Clover Park community for responding in such huge numbers over the last few days. Please do keep coming out if you haven't had a test. And, and just to clarify, that surveillance testing in Clover Park and Mount Wellington hasn't come, uncovered any new cases that you weren't aware of? Um, we have had, uh, we have found cases as a result of that extra testing, which is exactly why we're doing the extra testing, because we want to uncover uh, any cases that, 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 may, that may be there. So it's really important, um, as Deputy Prime Minister says, it's not just people who are symptomatic, but asymptomatic people as well. I believe, it's, I believe it's one case in Clover Park. One case, so one yeah. case. And how much of this long tail is due to people breaching their bubbles? Well, overall, the compliance has been good, and we've had we ask that question every single day of of the Auckland Regional Public Health and the police and others, and and they are very confident that people are are keeping to the rules. One or two examples have come through where perhaps we've seen a mingling between uh, a couple of households. Uh, I wouldn't regard that as as flagrant bubble breaching. I think it's just sometimes people the way their their lives are organised. But we do ask people to stick to their bubble. And one thing I we've also been advised is that once people have uh, got a positive result, we're getting very very good mm -hmm. compliance. We don't really have any examples of that at this stage. Just Jason, from the sorry. modelling yesterday, um, the seven thousand deaths um, that was assumed at eighty percent. Um, that's assumed that fi the Pfizer vaccine is only at the midpoint of what is a zero to 100 um, effectiveness scale. How effective is the vaccine? Oh, I'll turn to Dr McElnay for, for the technical side of that. I haven't seen any change in the view of the efficacy of Pfizer, which is, you know, which is high. Uh, the nature of modelling is that you will always have to create a set of circumstances, and it pops out a number at the other end. Um, there are different modellers with different views about these matters, uh, but we have no doubt that Pfizer has a very high level of efficacy. But do you have any... On that, oh, on that. very high level, about 95% efficacy against death and severe disease. And uh, where the where the vaccines are, are have have a lower level of effectiveness, is milder disease, any infection, and then ultimately um, transmission. Uh, and that's where that we're still we are still waiting for latest updates, particularly for Delta variant and the effectiveness of Pfizer. For transmission, it's, um, the evidence shows that it's still very, very effective for death and severe disease, but it's the transmission we're just waiting for updated information. So, so given that, do you believe at all this 7,000 deaths number? I mean, it seems alarmingly high. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to wade in to the debate about modelling. One of the things that has been present throughout the pandemic is that there are different views and therefore different models that get created about the impacts. The one, th I'll just finish Jason, the one thing I know for certain is that every modeler believes that the, every New Zealander should get vaccinated. The message people should take from modeling and people's response to modeling is that every New Zealander should be vaccinated.
the difference is yesterday in front of hundreds of thousands of people, the Prime Minister wheeled out a professor of modeling and just said, essentially announced it to the nation. It hadn't been peer reviewed. And since then, there's a, a lot of people that have come out and said that this is essentially scaremongering. What do you make of that criticism? It, it most definitely is not. I, I think I'd put the counterfactual to you that if we hadn't released that modeling, you would be sitting here, and perhaps not you, Jason, but one of your colleagues would be sitting here today asking me why we'd hidden it. It's important for us that we put out uh, the results of the modelling that's been done. Uh, it's mis it's um, Professor Hendy's model. There are other people who have a different view about that. The really important thing to note is the more people that we get vaccinated, the better it will be for all New Zealanders in terms of being able to return to the levels of freedom that we've come is it, fair, is it fair to say that you seek, as a Cabinet, a range of views on these things, that you're not only listening to, to Professor Hendy, but people like Rodney Jones who have been part of this debate also provide advice that yeah, well, we've taken advice from a vast array of people, um, not only the modellers like Professor Hendy or Rodney Jones, but equally the groups that we've established with the likes of Professor Sir David Skeg and others. We have a technical advisory group that advises the ministry on a regular basis. Uh, this is modelling that uh, was provided to the government in a transparent way. It's been put out there. Of course it's contested. And bear in mind, it's also the outcome is determined by what we all do. It's determined by getting vaccinated and the other public health measures that we might take alongside that. So this is an example of us being transparent about the information that we have, but no New Zealander should be left in any doubt whatsoever. If we can get our levels of vaccination up, that will give us options to return to some of the freedoms that we know people want. Minister, on the orphan outbreak, uh, obviously you're, you're pretty confident or, or at least hopeful that you can get it tapped down if it's very faces. If you don't, if it continues at the kind of current rate of rumbling along, as, as, as um, Bloomfield said, not widespread transmission, but still creating cases, can you guarantee that you won't let it spread out of Auckland by, by lowering Auckland to level two, even if Auckland itself might deserve to be a level two, keeping some kind of ring fence around? Because obviously there's no COVID in the rest of the country. Mm. So. Uh I mean, we'll take the advice of our public health officials as we have all along, and so I'm not going to preempt a decision today about advice that we haven't seen. We've seen a good number today. Uh, we want to see more days where that number goes down. Uh, we'll get the advice about where um, the pockets of transmission are, how confident we feel that we've got those contained, and then we can take decisions from there. So I, I know what, why you're asking what you're asking, uh, but we have to take this one step at a time, and we've got a considerable amount of time to go before Cabinet will be reassessing alert levels. You have to run tension, though, between giving all from this freedoms, which they, you know, might say is deserved and, and, and obviously helping the economy a lot in the largest mm -hmm. city, versus the fact that the rest of the country has no COVID, and if you allow free transmission between Auckland and the rest of the country, you probably will, even if it's a small amount of cases, let COVID get out of Auckland. Yeah, as, as I've said, we'll, we'll continue to take a precautionary approach. It's the approach that we've taken all along. And the Prime Minister's made clear that while Auckland is at that elevated alert level of three or four, then the country, the rest of the country will stay at alert level two. Uh, but we have to analyse the outbreak and look closely at it and measure that risk. Uh, the other thing I'd point out too is the Prime Minister indicated yesterday that obviously we're doing more thinking about where we go from here as vaccination rates increase, and you'll hear more about that in the coming weeks too. Prime Minister, we'll go to Zane down the back. Apologies to the other day. Too. <laughs> uh, a moving house out of Auckland was allowed uh, last time at level three. Why is this change in policy um, not been properly communicated, and will there be a rule change to allow Aucklanders to move? Uh, if they want to get it done. Yes, yeah, so that was the comment that I made earlier on. Um, we took a decision, which the Prime Minister did talk about on Monday, that with the Delta variant, we need to be incredibly cautious and careful. And so a decision was made that movements would stay essentially the same under Alert Level 3 as they had been under Alert Level 4. However, as I said, we note that the longer the outbreak goes on, the more difficult it becomes for people in the circumstances you're in. You can only push a settlement date out so far. And so the work that we're going to be doing over the next couple of days is to sort out uh, the exemptions regime to be able to, to deal with people who are leaving Auckland. So it's not about people who are coming and going who have reasons such as that. Um, we'll seek that advice over the next couple of days and have something to say early next week. Can I just ask a, yep. uh, one on the COVID fund? Um, what do you make of Judith Collins describing Creative NZ grants from the COVID fund as dodgy? Oh, well, I totally reject that. 
uh, the decisions that we've made around the COVID response and recovery fund have been taken a, a number of different times. Um, one thing I would note is that a number of the Creative New Zealand grants that some people have chosen to highlight actually weren't even funded out of the COVID grant. Uh, but where we have provided supports to our art sector, it's been a recognition of the tremendous damage done by COVID to the ability to make income for artists and for performances to be put on. Uh, and so we've had the, the wage subsidy scheme open to artists throughout, which not every country has done, and we've had additional direct funding to the art sector because it's an important part of our society and our economy. Bernard. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister, the Level 3 restrictions, uh, which Ministry of Health have said they only accepted 5% of the applications, uh, you've said that you're looking at making it easier for people to leave who are, who are buying houses or whatever. What other restrictions are you looking at uh, easing a bit? Because there's a lot of businesses and others who apply to get out but have been refused. Can, can that be eased a bit more? Yeah, so look, we'll, we'll take the advice that we get. Um, we remain committed to a precautionary approach here with Delta, but we do recognise that the longer restrictions are in place, the more challenging it becomes. Um, I've mentioned some of the personal areas today. In terms of businesses, ultimately those exemption decisions do end up back with the Director General of Health, and I no doubt he will be in the same period of the time he's giving us this advice, taking a look at that. Uh, the problem here, as we often talk about, is cu cumulative risk. It's, you know, one particular business can say, well, what about me? I've got workers who need to move across the boundary. But then if you do that for everyone, you have very large numbers of people moving. Uh, what we do do, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, is make sure that freight particularly can move. And we have seen increased volumes of freight moving over the last uh, w few days. Uh, so we'll take a look at that, but we'll be guided by the advice of the Director General. Sorry. Ben? The, um, the Wellington Phoenix, the Mighty Wellington Phoenix, are about to take off on their third season affected by COVID. They can't play at home, they'd love to play at home. Um, obviously, that's pro probably more of an aspiration. But like, what assurances or what can you, what hope can you give them that at some stage they'll be able to play in front of their home fans? This well, I very much hope that that can happen. Uh, but obviously, right now, uh, the decisions that they have to make are based on the current state of travel guidance and 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 the fact that we don't have a a, a Trans Tasman bubble at this time. As you know from the reconnecting New Zealanders work, we want to move to a situation where we can have more movement at the border. Um, that is still our plan into next year. But to get there, we all have to get vaccinated. Well, I'm not going to preempt decisions that might come next year, but for now, the, the settings are exactly the same. We have some group allocations, uh, and there is a process for teams to apply for those group allocations. Um, for the Phoenix, obviously they have the issue that they... Um, if they were to be playing, they have a schedule which would see them having to try back, fly backwards and forwards, which wouldn't actually work out. Okay. Uh, um, Lillian. Lillian. Hi. Hey, Lillian. Two for two, two weeks in a row. Two, two for two. <laughs> so, Zane, how's it going? <laughs> um, it's a World Health Organization today is recognising the importance of vaccines and vaccine support for vulnerable COVID-19 patients. Is that something New Zealand is likely to approve, but also is cost going to be an obstacle? Well, we, we um, always look at um, WHO advice um, uh, in great detail and um, our MedSafe, our regulator, uh, will be, um, they're, the, they're the part of the ministry that uh, looks at the regulation of medicines, so certainly anything like that I know that they will be considering. Would cost, would cost be effective? Would cost be effective? Or for you, Minister? <laughs> Not from a regulator's point of view. <laughs> and from the Minister of Finance's point of view, I mean, we've continued to try and put as much support behind our response to COVID-19 as possible, and if we find uh, ways that we can support New Zealanders uh, through it, we always look to do that. Where are we at generally with antibody treatments here in New Zealand? Um, I'll have to come back to you on, on the specifics of that. There are a number of antibody, um, antibody treatments available. I'm not just not sure where we're up to with an approval process, um, but we can come back to you on that. Yeah. So just going back to yesterday's modelling, doesn't some of the reaction and pushback to it highlight the need for a standalone agency to oversee the government's response to COVID-19, as the Brian Roach has called for? I wouldn't necessarily... I mean, 
that argument could stand on its own merit. So I wouldn't necessarily say that because two different modelers um, might disagree with one another that that particularly highlights the need for it. Uh, as I said earlier, we take a range of advice. Um, this is science. It's not always absolute. And one of the things in the case of COVID-19 is that as a government, we've had to make decisions with imperfect information from the very, very beginning. It's the nature of COVID. It's a rapidly evolving area. There is contested views and contested science throughout it. Modelers will always differ from time to time. The government has the ability to listen to all of them and then take that advice in. Um, can I just hop off that, but then I have a separate question after that. Um, just in terms of your comment earlier that, you know, if, we, if it hadn't been wheeled out the way that it was yesterday, then you would have been accused of hiding it. Um, is, are there other lots of information, other modellers, what other bits of information are you receiving? And is that being made public? Because, I mean, it's not being made public in the same way that it was yesterday, but what other modelling are you getting that we perhaps aren't seeing in that same way? I'm not sure if there's any particular examples that I can give you of modelling that you're not seeing. Um, we, we, we're, Professor Hendy is obviously funded through his, his institution and so therefore um, he's one that we've, we've listened to particularly but you've seen others release modelling from time to time uh, including Rodney Jones who, who you've heard from but on the scale that we're talking about there's nothing comparable to that. Just, and just to confirm off that, um, isn't, doesn't MB also fund that research partly? Mm, it does, as I said, it's, it's partly government funded, partly government funded that's correct. Can I, just another question, um, what reports or feedback are you getting around, in particular, sort of misinformation, but not just um, COVID and sort of anti-vax type stuff, but also in light of the Lindwell terror?